All right. We're back. I'm Camille. I'm Evan. Here we are. Welcome back to Make Your Own Luck. Or welcome if it's your first time. Yeah. You know, we're still in the early stages. True. Could, could have some newcomers. They're they're tuning in for a good one too. This is if you've hit play on this, this is for me it's a big one because I'm excited <laughs> for everyone to experience Camille's um, level of Bruce Springsteen. And this is the discussion you're gonna hear today. Yeah. Are we 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 we're just calling this the boss episode. The boss this is episode. Really just a confession of my love for Bruce Springsteen, um, why I love Bruce Springsteen, uh, the role that he has played in both of our lives as a as a peak New Jerseyan. Yep. All of those things. So stay tuned for that. But while we've got you real quick, if you really enjoy this episode, leave us a comment either on YouTube or in any of the podcast platforms you might be listening this to this on. Subscribe in any capacity, whatever that means for the platform you're on. Save us, subscribe, follow us, because uh, I think every podcast platform now is a little different. Um, if you're listening on Spotify, please follow. It helps us out because this whole thing's hosted on Spotify and they we get a little extra metric there if you do. Um, socials are... We are at Make Your Own Luck Pod. So on Instagram, at Make Your Own Luck Pod. Uh, you can also search on YouTube. You can just type in at Make Your Own Luck Pod. But yeah, like Evan said, you can search us on wherever you like to listen to podcasts. You can find us. And uh, yeah, if you really want to follow along on this journey, we would appreciate it. Follow, like, subscribe. And um, I promise that not every episode will be about Bruce Springsteen. But this one is. So please enjoy The Boss. All right. What is today? Today, so you'll probably be hearing this a little later, but today is actually National Pork Roll Day. Yes. Did you know that? I didn't. You just told me that right before we started, but I was surprised I should know as a good New Jerseyan. Yeah. I mean, I learned it in the same way that everyone learns these things nowadays, that somebody posted about it on Instagram. Um, but... So today we just decided, you know, we, we put the first episode out. We talked yeah. just kind of a little bit about what we're doing, why we're doing it. And um, I think we decided that today we're just going to take it back. We're going to take it way back to the very beginning, uh, to, the, to our roots. That's it. And our roots are in the great state of New Jersey. Yes, where one of our favorite people and New Jersey's native son Bruce Springsteen is from I would say I would I would categorize him as the prince of New Jersey That's the king fair. of New Jersey yes. um Jersey's favorite son uh there's a lot of different titles for it um but yeah I feel like growing up in New Jersey and wanting to be in music uh, I don't know how we would get away with not talking about the boss. Agreed. Yeah. So. Especially both of us growing up super close to Asbury Park. Yeah. So uh, my mom was actually from Asbury Park. She was born um, in Asbury Park, lived there, went to high school there. Um, I guess technically when I was growing up, my grandparents lived in Neptune. They moved there. It's a town just next to Asbury Park. Um, so, yeah, I grew up every weekend going down to my grandparents' house. And um, at that point, that was like the mid-90s. And Asbury Park really was nothing to speak of. Um, my grandfather was the mailman in Asbury Park as a career. Uh, he had retired by the time I was born. But... Uh, yeah, we would go down to the boardwalk and there was like maybe one or two shops open and we would say hi to everybody because they still knew him. Larry, is, I, I only knew him as Pop Up, <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, and we we grew up just going down there and to me it was just kind of this spooky, haunted beach. <laughs> I think to mo most of us in the 90s, my first big memory, aside from maybe my parents' maybe taking me there as like a little kid was uh, going to the Warp Tour in 1997. So in the same timeline where yeah. I'm sure 
they picked that as a site because it was accessible and cheap to probably put a produce a show on. But I also remember my parents dropping myself and my like childhood best friend off. And my mom was like, Oh, you didn't realize it, but we stood there most of the day and just made sure you guys were okay. Like through the chain link fence, she <laughs> yeah. tells the story. Of course we were oblivious to it, but yeah, it was, I think Asbury's revitalization has only come on more recently. Yeah. So, I mean, that was obviously like, that was the thing when we would go to warp tour and skate and surf that was down there, there was nothing else. Like you got dropped off, you got let in the gates and you know, you ate inside, you watched music inside. And then when it was over, your parents picked you up right. or, you know, you got on the train or whatever. Yeah. Um, but there was nothing else. It wasn't like a destination. It wasn't like a, a which is crazy to have like beachfront property with a boardwalk, right. you know, and um, because the infrastructure was there always, whether yeah. it was maintained or not was one thing, but right. the infrastructure itself was there. They had a beautiful pier. Well, yeah, at one point and, and convention then it was hall, yeah, you know, convention hall yeah. was still uh, now I, I believe like the shell of convention hall you can still go inside like the arcade as they call it but the actual venue i think is condemned like they can't do shows it and, probably and was when they there. were doing shows yeah. in it in the early 2000s when we would have been there but all that to say right the the most iconic piece of that whole part of the Sh jersey shore a thing that has never gone away is the stone pony yep which leads us back into you know, talking about the person who put that place on the map. Yeah. I think that that was a big thing for me growing up. Honestly, I didn't even really start to listen to Bruce Springsteen's music. I mean, of course, you know, like Thunder Road, Born to Run. Um, but I didn't start listening to his music until I was in college. But being from that area, it was just kind of more fo folklore than sure. anything. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. he was just kind of this legendary... I mean, he is this legendary person, but, and now it's kind of a joke, but it would always be like, oh, my friend saw Bruce at Vintage Vinyl over the weekend, or, oh, you know, like, so there were all these, these sightings, and you would hear about it, and, and everyone would kind of have, like, their own story, their own connection. But also in a, now, it's on, it's being recorded, right? Yes. Somebody seeing him and instantly do, doing this yeah it's being documented so it was all lore yeah like our whole childhood teenage that's, years 20s it was lore if, that's if, a great point nobody you know, had selfies no, with bruce in 1995 no, yeah like you if you saw him out at a record store you didn't have a camera in your so pocket. it was a story oh that that's that's a really good point that's yeah. wild to think about um oh man my my personal like one story you know my mom grew up um on bangs avenue in asbury park and they lived caddy corner um, to uh, the Carters and Ernie Boom Carter was one of Bruce's drummers um, before Max and so my mom and my aunt they had this kind of thing they're like yeah we would hear them and you know they would be right there and my mom is still really good friends with Ernie's sister Madonna and so that was like always our little connection to to Bruce uh well, I've, you know, personally, like, never, I never, I never went to any shows when I was a kid. Um, I remember when he did the rehearsals for, I think it was the reunion tour. He did them, like, at Convention Hall, and they opened up the, the window, the doors and the windows, and they were, like, literally playing to the beach. And that was the first time I really remember hearing about, like, a Springsteen show. Because my aunt was like, it's in Asbury Park, we gotta go. And um, I think she went, we didn't go. Um, but that was, like, my first introduction to him as actually like, oh, this is a musician, not just this guy that right. we hear about all over um, and have this sort of like legendary image of. Um, yeah, and then in college, I dated someone who was like sort of your quintessential Bruce fan, you know, had the, the, the all the songs and, and the favorites and had seen him. And, um, and so that's kind of where I got like, really introduced to his music and I, I guess as they say the rest is history <laughs> i feel like though right when you break it down in in a perspective of now bruce like the grateful dead or a fish he has his, he's created his own version of that 
right? His oh, own definitely. rock and roll version of of that crowd. They're, the crowd is cult like in an, in the like kindest, warmest way. Like they love him. Yeah. Whether you grew up in New Jersey, minutes away from where the stories and the songs were told from the perspective of, or you grew up in the middle of Illinois, there's right. a relatable factor. But he just his his version of like the Grateful Dead or the Fish is like the middle class working person. It's not the totally. I, and I say this now and it's more a stereotype, but like the hippie vibe of like a Grateful Dead or a fish following. It's like the working man, like because that's what the stories he was telling were, that's the the following. That's the cult following of Bruce. Yeah. And I think what you'll you find as you dig into it is actually that a lot of people are like him in that Bruce will be the first one to say like I've never actually had any of those experiences. Like he's never had a real job his entire life. And he kind of jokes about it, but he was able to write and tell these stories from the perspective of that character. And there are certainly people out there who have that working man life and working, working man mentality um, that love him for that. But a lot of people are the same way. You know, me, I've never worked in a factory, you know, I guess technically I worked in like an Amazon (laughs) warehouse, but (laughs) I don't think that's like a precursor for appreciating the music and the sound and the stories. Um, and it's funny you mentioned, you know, Grateful Dead Fish, uh, Bruce has a Sirius XM radio channel and I don't think there's a lot of artists in a, in a contemporary rock way that could carry their own their own station you know but because he's been touring for you know 50 <laughs> 50 years uh and consistently you know you have some artists that have been around for 50 years but maybe they tour once every 5 years you know those first 30 years of his career i mean he was living on the road so there's just this incredible catalog of live music and live shows that allows you i mean my husband jokes about it with me because I leave that station on in the car. And he's like, how do you just listen to Bruce Springsteen every time you're in the car? And it just doesn't feel that way because it's a different show. It's a different version. You know, I have my little versions that I like and then I get excited when they come on. And to me, everyone feels different. Um, and so I think that's a real mark to be able to have a, a station that plays your music, you know, pretty much 24-7. That really says something about what he's been able to build as an artist but i think in that right like every bruce show is different even now like every show they've been on the road or were on the road this year and i imagine if you saw them in st louis or you saw them in boston yeah you know they're going to be a much different show than if you go to new jersey it's just gonna be right and i think that part of that is the nature of live music i think that um you know if you get on the the message boards, which is basically just Facebook these days, the there's a little bit more of a um, a set set list this last tour, and that's been sort of a I wouldn't say complaint, but people have sort of because the whole thing about Bruce was that you would go see him and he would play the, a three hour show, and it could be completely different than the night before, uh, and he would you would hold up signs and he would take requests, and so there was like this element of of really not knowing at all what you were going to get. Um, and I mean, listen, I'm not going to fault the guy at 70 something years old for going out and playing mostly the same show every night and putting on a consistent show. Uh, but in past years, it's definitely been just like completely a toss up of what you're going to get. And I think that's added to that. And for me, you know, um, when I look back and, and when I started getting into music and, to, and into touring, he was always to me like the gold standard, you know, of someone who, you know, you're going to spend a little bit more, but you are going to get a show. The first (laughs) man in rock and roll to do with, I mean, man and band, you know, is amazing multi, multi, multi piece band, but three hours, two and a half, whatever it was, he set that rock and roll precedent where now like the Foo Fighters also have to play for three hours or they feel like they're doing their fans injustice, but it's like, you know, if you're spending your hard earned money for both of those artists, you're, you're going to get, a, you know, you're not getting 75 minutes or 90, which again are also long, right? Those that's are, already that's, that's a, long a pretty show. long, great show. But if you know, two to three hours, yeah, 
and at 70 i don't he's still doing it yeah i yeah. think uh the show that we went to in atlanta clocked in at about two hours 45 minutes and people are even like complaining about that it's that like, it was short yeah that it's short but then that <laughs> right that's the flip you set this precedent your whole career that they, you're gonna be entertained for potentially three hours and yeah then it's i you got i mean he's got to be tired now oh. i know he loves it but he's got to be tired too it's a lot you so know you just set this precedent that you're gonna put on these marquee long-winded marathon shows yeah i will say the coolest thing i ever saw in terms of like rock and roll hall of fame level stuff and we were there and there was a bruce exhibit and we live in an era now with technology where everything has been kind of it snowballs so far everything yeah. you know we're at light speed now and we'll stay there for <laughs> eternity till we're not here anymore but from a technical gear perspective um i they had one of his telecasters and they were showing that because he had played these stadium shows forever he is like one of the original like not just one stadium show on a whole, like he was playing multiple nights of stadiums across America, Yeah, you know, f from the late eighties, nineties to now. Yep. And he would have these huge, 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 huge thrusts. And he would be like, you know, a hundred feet from where he started, where the main part of the show was. For anyone who doesn't know what a thrust oh, is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> it's the little part of the stage that sort of like extends into the crowd and it's, you know, various shapes. Sometimes it's a runway. Sometimes it's like a runway and there's a circle at the end, but that's what the thrust is. Yeah. So when you're at a, when you're at a show, especially like an outdoor or a big um, show in an arena, yeah. you know, an NBA or uh, NHL arena, anything that's not part of the normal square stage where the, the band is playing most of the band, if it's that point when the artist like comes out and they're, you can almost, you feel like you can almost touch them. Yeah. There's a separation and they've like kind of become one. With yeah. The crowd. Uh, that would be a throw technical term. Yes. Insider <laughs> term is a thrust, but yeah, it's just like a longer skinny stage that they would extend off the main stage. But Bruce has been doing that forever like that's just part of like now they're very elaborate at times depending oh, yeah. on who you are but you know in the rock and roll era of like 80s 90s but so the 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 thing that i saw at the rock and roll hall of fame is he was so far and the technology at the time even though he you know you have your guitar and then you have your xlr cable or um instrument cable that would connect up and to the amp or to what, whatever it br brings the sound back from the instrument into the into speakers the, into the speakers or into the amp or whatever whatever it would have been in like the 80s 90s it just he it was so long that there was a delay or if it was um a wireless signal which would be like um a microphone with no cable so like there are also it for guitars they have things that like you can connect to your guitar so that it's your cable free essentially right and this would have been very early Th days and this is in a time technology. before bluetooth before yeah. even like really cordless phones but it's, they use radio frequencies or radio signal like that's how this has always been in the professional audio world that's we're getting super technical but just to explain and he had a version of that either with a cable or without, but it was so long that they had to like essentially hot wire his guitar to boost the signal. Like it was like a whole, yeah. like now we just have this technology and it works. You can be on the other side of a stadium and play the guitar and it's just all linked up a certain way and it has no cable and it's flawless audio, you know, but back then he was so, they were pushing the boundaries of like how far he could be that, there was like a booster in the guitar <laughs> so that it, it, he could play and it would have the signal strength to go either down the cable. And I, I can't remember, but it was just like, for me, a nerd that loves all that. Yeah. The coolest thing to see, they had like cut a little slit in the guitar. So it had its own powered speaker. It was just something complicated. I'm probably, if, if you are a Bruce Springsteen fan and hear this or know about <laughs> technical audio guitar stuff, it's, I'm probably going to sound crazy, but I, I remember seeing it and being like, he was on the forefront. Somebody on yeah. his team, his guitar tech, his you know his his person who was handling his equipment back then, they were doing things at the time that weren't done. So they were finding these workarounds so that he could run around <laughs> this whole stadium and perform. And well, I feel like that's something that he doesn't necessarily get a lot of credit for because it's not a big flashy show. There's not a lot of like gimmicks and lights and video. You know, that's never been a part of it. But I think that very quietly he's always been someone that was just trying to move 
not just music, but anything in like a direction that people aren't thinking about and doing it in ways where, you know, it's like when you chop up vegetables to give them to kids, like he hides things like that in everything that he does kind of thing. Like, you know, you would never think about that when he's out there doing that, playing a show, but that's a little thing that was probably really important to him that made a big difference. And I think that he's done the same with his music and his songwriting. You know, one of, besides me loving the music and just thinking he's a cool guy, I think one of my favorite things about Bruce is, you know, that like the relationship between him and Clarence and how he's been so open about what it was like to, you know, have Clarence be, you know, one of the only black guys out there with him in this time where this country was going through all sorts of things and what it was like for him to realize what it was like to be in Clarence's shoes and the difference between what, how Clarence was treated on stage to when they would like go out after. Um, and I think that was like the very beginning of, you know, uh, the, everyone calls it social activism or social justice or whatever that is. But I think that, you know, tying in with his every man working man sort of persona, he's just always been, you know, on the side of like treating people right and fair and well, and, and knowing that like, we all like work really hard and we should all be treated a certain way. And that just extends into everything that he does. And I think, for me, when someone has a platform and they choose to use it to do, you know, a little bit more than they have to, uh, I'm, I'm always going to respect that, you know? So that's, that's been a big reason why I think I've become so invested in Bruce. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I consider I'm a, I'm a younger fan. I haven't clocked nearly as many shows as, you know, people have their counts, their hundreds, Um, but I think I've been really intentional that I've, you know, I've gotten to see him in different ways. You know, I got to see him solo, um, on like an acoustic arena tour. I got to see him at giant stadium when they did those last 10 shows, closing giant stadium. Um, I've seen him in an arena full band. Uh, we went to the Broadway show, which was really cool. And then, you know, saw him again on this, this round in the arena. Um, but the Broadway show is actually what sparked um, the hat. That's where it all started. Yeah, so tell the story of the hat. Camille <laughs> has told this in bits and parts and now has an entire website, yeah. <laughs> portion of her website that explains the hat because there's a hat and then she's got stickers to go with the hat. And uh, I'm sure everybody thinks it's something different. Yeah. You know, it's probably, it makes it, the hat makes it feel like a bigger potential like lawsuit or court case than it really was. Absolutely. But, uh, I just love that it's, it sparked a fan base for you. Like your fandom has shown through to your business endeavor and it's like, a, it's a circle. It's given back to you now. And you, I feel like what's the organization that you Bruce, been, Bruce funds. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I just love that it's just come full circle, right? Like yeah. you had this fun idea and it's sparked something else. <laughs> and now it's like a giving back to fans and the fans have like, you know, it's like, it, I don't know. Again, I just like the the like family culture vibe of it all. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing that, that the culture of Bruce fandom breeds is that, you know, when you meet a Bruce fan, there's an instant connection you sit you talk you you like out bruce each other you know it's, it's a total thing um but yeah so the hat came around um in i guess it was in i don't remember when the incident happened i think it was 2019 um it was it was right it was the year before he got the jeep super bowl ad so uh when he got the jeep super bowl ad like two weeks later, this thing came out and they ended up like canceling the ad while they were figuring out what was going on. But basically what happened was Bruce, there's an area in um, New Jersey and it is a, it's a national recreation area, which is basically like kind of like a national park. Mm -hmm. It's not quite a national park, but there's rangers or whatever. And um, Bruce is known to like ride his motorcycle there and going along with kind of the folklore that we were talking about some fans were at this national recreation area and lo and behold, Bruce Springsteen gets off his motorcycle and they are just like, is this really happening? This is crazy. And they are drinking, which you are not allowed to do in this particular national recreation area. 
Um, and so they see Bruce and they're like, oh my God, Bruce, we do a shot with us. And so they have like, you know, he does like a little fake shot basically just to say he does it with them. And immediately a park ranger pulls up. And, uh, so the park ranger tries to say that, you know, he's drinking and driving and everyone's like, that's obviously not what's happening. Um, he's, they ended up like doing a blood alcohol test. It was way under, like, it was this whole thing. Everyone's like, obviously you take drinking and driving very seriously, but it was very clear to everyone that that was not the case. Um, and so they ended up all getting tickets. So they all like, they got tickets for drinking in this recreation area. And because it was a national park, they had to go to court. And so at the time, this was obviously mid pandemic. Um, so it was like a zoom court, but Bruce Springsteen had to call into court and say, yes, I'll pay my fine or, you know, whatever it was that he had to do. They, they, they dropped all the DUI charges that never came to fruition. Um, but yeah, so he got this court case. And if you Google it, United States versus Bruce Springsteen, it's a real court case. And everyone just kind of thought, oh, I mean, that's Bruce, you know, like he's he's he'll go the extra mile to like make someone's day, even if it means getting a ticket. But also it goes back to your comment about the myth from the start. Had it been a pre social media time that all could have transpired. But like the rest of the world maybe wouldn't have known. Maybe that would have yeah. turned up in the Asbury Park Press or something. Yeah, right? but it, it just became this kind of thing. And, and honestly, then it kind of went away. You know, everyone stopped talking about it. Um, but when he went to do the, the second run of the Broadway show, uh, we had gotten tickets and I told myself, I'm like, I'm not going to read any spoilers. Like, I don't want to ruin it. But I read like a review that mm -hmm. just was more of a review of the show, not like saying what happened. But they did say that he made a joke about it, like saying, kind of recapping the last couple of years of his life. He had done the podcast with President Obama. Which was fantastic, by the way. <laughs> fantastic. I mean, you want to talk about like my perfect... <laughs> combination of things it was amazing um so anyway he made a joke and he said oh you know i got this ticket and the whole united states was against me and <laughs> and and so i was like oh man at this time i had just started making trucker hats and i was like that would be such a fun hat and i'll wear it to the broadway show and you know maybe somebody will ask me about it and that'll be the end of it so i make these hats and I thought maybe, oh, maybe I'll post them on the Reddit page. or And then I said, yeah, you know, I'm just going to wear it. And that'll be the end of it. So I wore it. And uh, then I came home. And I started wearing it a little bit more. And people would ask me about it. What's the story? And I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. Like, people kind of like it. And so then I thought, well, I wonder who else would appreciate this. And this was purely just like a... I just want people to get a laugh out of it. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. And um, at the time, I had I was really getting into the Sirius station, and they had just done something with Danny Clinch at his gallery in Asbury Park. And Danny Clinch is a world-renowned rock photographer. He's um, photographed most of Bruce's album covers for the last couple of years. Pearl also, Jam, Foo Fighters. Pearl Jam, Foo Fighters. I mean, Weezer, Fish, Tupac. I think Nirvana like, at some you know, in the early, yeah, it, it goes on. The list on is and huge. On, yeah, on yeah. and on. Tupac, and, yeah, I yes. always forget that one. And so Danny had moved his operation from New York to Asbury Park um, at the time about five years earlier. And... I just thought that was so cool, you know, being from Asbury Park, knowing that th there was nothing there to me to see someone like that come in, bring their business, bring art, spirit, music, all of that. Um, I just thought it was really awesome. And so I just put a couple hats or put one hat in a box. I wrote Danny a note. I said, um, you know, I used to work at Atlantic Records in New York. I've, I saw like lots of the photographs that you took for bands there. And, um, I'm just, I'm really grateful for what you're doing for Asbury Park. And I, I know you always wear hats. And so thought maybe you just get a laugh out of this. Just put it in a box, sent it. Didn't know anyone, nothing. And, uh, I sent it and I didn't hear anything for a couple weeks. And I sent them a message on the gallery page and just said, Hey, I sent you guys a box. Just want to make sure you got it. You know, no pressure. And, Maybe about a week later, I got a message from Tina, who who runs the gallery, and she was like, oh my gosh, we just opened the box, we're all flipping out, this is so great, um, 
can we buy a couple more? Uh, Danny wants to send one to Bruce and to Eddie Vedder. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, first of all, don't have to buy them. I'll send you two more. <laughs> and again, I, being in the music industry, I know what it's like when people get gifts, when people get handed something. Right. A lot of the time it's in passing, you know. So all this time I really thought, didn't think anything of it. So box, box them up, send them down. And then maybe three weeks later was the See Here Now Festival in Jersey and Pearl Jam was playing. And that's um, Danny and um, another guy named uh, Tim Donnelly, who's become a good friend, and H.M. Woolman. They run this festival. So they... In Asbury Park. In Asbury Park. Yeah. So this has been the first kind of very large scale festival to come back to Asbury. Um, they've been building it for uh, the last, since 2018. They've had Dave Matthews and it's right on the beach, like feet in the sand. And to me, everybody you just describe if there was going to be a team to do it and do it well and have it hopefully be a thing that continues and it becomes a legacy thing there. That, that yeah, sign me up. These are long, these are all long time music industry veterans that are very invested in doing something that means something and very cool and um, and being respectful to the city. Yeah, absolutely. City, and so, so. It's, it's, you know, getting to see them do that has been really cool. Um, but yeah, so Pearl Jam was playing and I, again, just didn't really think anything of it. Cool. And then my phone just starts going bananas. Like, people are ordering the hat and i'm like what is happening right now just as a reference <laughs> point i'm with camille sometimes sometimes i'm at the shop sometimes we're here and you'll just hear because it it's it's uh yeah i have an alert for when for, there's like a sale yeah for what's your pos is, oh uh shopify. shopify so it'll, it sounds like a cash register yes. and so like i can imagine <laughs> kevin and her husband being like what is happening yeah. and, and just honestly, hearing the cash register sound sometimes I, it's a festival. cartoon it's like yeah, cha-ching, yeah. Yeah. Cha-ching, yeah. It's, it's very much a, yeah yeah and honestly sometimes i turn it off because it sounds really obnoxious like and sometimes it's someone buying a four dollar sticker but i'm saying i can only imagine yeah. kevin's like what is going on yeah, so like he, looking kevin, over at you being like what is Kev, happening kevin was at home and i was at uh, either the shop or the warehouse and my phone just will not stop going off and i at this point i still don't know what's going on mm. like i can't i haven't seen sometimes i get tagged in a picture somebody sends me something and i'm like oh that's what's going on and then i don't know maybe like an hour later finally someone sends me the picture and it's I mean, I get chills thinking about it. It's Eddie Vedder wearing the hat outside of the transparent gallery. And like someone is, it was like a fan photo because you can see Danny in the back actually snapping photos. A real photo. Real yeah. photos. Yeah. And I just, I, I will never forget that moment of being like, oh my gosh, it 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 worked. It's happening. Like he, he, he did it. He said he was going to do it. He did it. And now it's happening. And what am I going to do? <laughs> and that was also my first lesson in like when things like that happen, how it can, it can go left because like I didn't have enough of that color hat in stock and I went to order it and this was still like pandemic-y times and I couldn't get it. I couldn't get the navy blue hats and I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Like this is my one chance. And so I was like ordering hats from other suppliers and like going on black market eBay, <laughs> overpaying for hats just to get them in to send them out and it just became this whole thing. But anyway, so that was like the first big thing and that kind of put the hat on the map. And ever since then, it's just been really cool. I've had a couple other things like that happen. Um, but at a point, I kind of felt like it wasn't mine to keep, you know? Obviously, it was my idea and my design, and, and I'm really happy that people gravitated towards it. But I felt like I wanted to do something a little more with it. Um, and so that's when I um, I had heard about Bruce Funds, which is run by a woman named Donna. And Donna has a full-time job. She does this just because she loves it. And what she does is um, she works within the community to either get people to buy extra tickets to a Bruce show, or if they can't make it to a show, they reach out to her. And then she finds someone who, you know, maybe doesn't have the means and gets them a ticket to the show. And, um, you know, I know that there's a lot of causes in the world and there's a lot of things, but one thing that I've seen, and you've probably seen it firsthand from working in the music industry, 
sometimes, you know, yeah, it's great to give people money and it's great to help people with um, medical things. But a lot of times when people are in those positions, it's all about that. And they don't get a chance to just go to a show or listen to music that they love or just do something that doesn't have to do with whatever they're going through. And in those moments when I was able to give someone a meet and greet or a ticket when I was tour managing to see the joy and what like a lasting effect that that had, I knew how much that meant. And to see what Donna was doing purely out of the goodness of her heart and for the community, um, I just wanted to support that. So starting last year, uh, we began donating a portion of the sales of every single hat to her. Cool. And so what that does is um, she's not like a ticket broker, but sometimes people, she'll get a ticket to a show and someone's like, yeah, I can't afford the gas money or I can't afford the hotel. So, you know, with this supplemental income, she's able to help them out to like have a, a nice night out and actually like experience the show without worrying about all the I mean, other what things. A, what a cool we we touched on this a couple of minutes ago because those tickets are expensive and and they are, and they've gotten more expensive just with the way of ticketing and now we don't need to get into that but we know how that goes right now and yeah. the fees are out of hand so what a great way to bring joy to you, people in your community yeah the community of Bruce you know right, what I mean? bring right. joy bringing joy that and again yeah there's only so much you can do in those other moments that you just described, but like sometimes it's like, Hey, we got two tickets. We want you to go. We want you to have a good night. Oh, I can't get there. What do you need? Like, well, somebody will pick you up. Right. You know? So it's, yeah. it truly, again, going back to like the thought of the, the Bruce community feels akin to like the grateful dead community where it's like, it's a, it's a brother, sister peoplehood of folks that are just like really looking out for everyone. Yeah. And, and I think Bruce, like cultivating that environment, you know, with his social justice, with his activism, you know, putting us all on the same playing field. That's what it's all about. And, you know, for Donna, it's about coming within the community. You know, the point is not to get someone to go out and buy tickets for every show. You know, the point is for all of us to help each other. Like we're all fans of this music and we're all in this together. So, you know, there are people with her that have literally gone up and down the beer line and said, if all of you give me $5, we can get someone to the next Bruce show, you know? And like, that's what it's about. And I just think that that's so cool. And that I could be any small part of it is, is been incredibly re rewarding. Um, but yeah, so it's just been a really, f for me, obviously as a fan, it's been kind of a surreal moment. Um, I've, gotten to you know talk to management a little bit and like obviously from being on the other side of that I you know I don't really like get too much into that situation I just like let them know like I'm just having fun with this I hope that I'm also like helping some people and I hope you guys are cool with it and yeah. so far you know it's been a really good relationship and it's been really rewarding um but yeah so we'll see um we'll see what's on the horizon for the hat but yeah they're touring you know all through they're in europe right now and then they'll be back touring in the states in the fall so um the bruce funds money will be going to donna like through the entirety of this tour and then after that you know we'll figure out some other cause that it will go towards um but yeah it's it's been really cool you know i i, I told the story the other day and i told it to you um John Stewart was in town a couple of weeks ago. He's, you know, if Bruce is the king, he would be the prince of New Jersey. And uh, he, you know, is, is from where we went to school. And I just happened to be at an event and I had the hats and um, I had the opportunity to like, I mean, I definitely like kind of hunt, hunted him down. And <laughs> but I was able to hand him a hat and tell him thank you for what he does and talk about the hat and you know, knowing that he appreciated it and also got to talk to him about, you know, Danny and, and the other people that I've gotten to know through this process. And for me, like, that's what this hat and what Bruce is all about is like being able to have those moments with people. And um, for me to be able to look John Stewart in the eye and feel like I'm actually talking about something that he cares about. I mean, that's like, 
I don't know. I could just shut the whole shop down now. Oh, I mean, I got to meet Bruce first, but <laughs> top of the list. If anybody's watching and can help Camille with that, email me because I want to be the one that connects that and then we surprise her. So yeah, shoot me a message on the side and we'll find a way to get Camille to meet uh, the boss himself. Yeah. So, I mean, I know that sometimes it, 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 it's, it becomes kind of a joke and, you know, I've got the radio station on and I've got a Bruce Springsteen air freshener in my car and got I'm some me- candles in the shop. I got some candles got in the, the shop. Hat. But it really has become like a little haven for 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 folks like us from New Jersey, you know? So many people come into the store when I'm there and they just want to talk about home, New Jersey, Bruce and it's my own little community that I've built and I'm super proud of that and really really happy about it and if there's nothing else that comes out of this shop, um, that's the thing that I'm, you know, I've been really most proud of. I like the safe haven of New Jersey and that little tiny shop you got. That's right. I'm gonna finish this with okay. You're gonna think have to think long and hard here, I'm sure. But let's go. I'm gonna keep it simple. Top three. <laughs> Bruce songs and it can be across you know obviously we have a whole spectrum you can you can name live cuts of things yeah like I'm gonna tell you that there's an Atlantic City live cut that's my favorite and I feel like it's from is it the one from Leeds maybe to me that I mean that's like is that the iconic one? yeah what year was that Ooh, I don't know you're but like more recent or like vintage Bruce I honestly don't even know yeah I'm gonna have to look that up now yeah that's my personal that's my all-time Bruce song. Yeah. Like the original great, obviously from a record where everything was very stripped down and chill. And then you get an electrified version of that at points. And then you get the E Street version of that, which I think is the Mecca. Because there was the... I say this with all due respect, but like the 90s Bruce band that was not the E Street band, yeah. right? In the like post unplugged, post Bruce right. Live on MTV or VH1 or whatever those era, like it it didn't feel the same. The song, but what I kind of love that there's so much history of Bruce tunes in the wild is that it all feels different. Yes. Right. You can hear the just Bruce and a guitar version of Atlantic City and it's eerie and then you can hear the e street and it's an anthem because right. it's going to be an anthem <laughs> right. because that's right. how everything that they play feels like you know for the most part feel like that's big and up feels like an anthem um and then i don't know i feel like i've sent this to you because i've sent this to you recently and i was saying i was going down a rabbit hole of this but there are, um is a, a justin's towns earl version of that uh, song that he did for like oh yeah it was uh, it was like an AV club thing uh, yep, yep. and it's like one of the most like obviously I feel like he would he's someone that would have met Bruce Springsteen because Bruce knows his dad yeah um, Steve Earle like right. I'm sure they've had some kind of friendship over the years they're from the same era they're both deep rooted songwriters blah 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 but like you just you like listen and you're like oh that like he gets it oh yeah he gets this feel when a cover like just has going. that yeah that yeah. sentiment you know you you there's certain people that know how to embrace that better than others i don't think i can possibly pick top three brew songs it's like literally impossible but i will say some of like i'll give you like my highlights that i think like represent what i like most about it um and I, I based this more on the Broadway show because these were the, the two songs that I got the most emotional about at the Broadway show. Um, number one was 41 Shots, which is a song that um, Bruce wrote in the wake of the killing of Amadou Diallo in uh, New York. And that was a big thing because to some people he was speaking out against police brutality and you know, but Bruce is also a man of the people and the working class. And so there's this weird dichotomy where I think the NYPD was kind of like, wait, are you talking about us? You know, like that, that whole thing happened, Mm -hmm. but he still wasn't afraid to like face it head on, you know, and, and the commentary in it, um, I recently, like I listened to it when everything was going on after the murder of George Floyd and it is word for word still relevant today which, you know, in some ways is very sad and disheartening, but in some ways that he was capturing 
that sentiment 20 years ago right speaks to why i love him so much um and then the second one at the broadway show is 10th avenue freeze out uh, cause you know, that song is about him and Clarence and he does a, a whole bit in the Broadway show about Clarence and their relationship and their love. And I mean, there's these photos that are from there. I think they were from in the Morrison gallery of like him literally on Clarence's shoulders, like a child or like them kissing each other on the mouth. And they just had this like pure friendship and love and adoration and respect and, I mean, those kind of relationships that you get to have in your life are very rare. And I think like how revered that is for him. And he still does like a montage for Clarence during like the arena tour and stuff. And um, I just think that that's such a special, special thing. Um, Yeah. And then that Leeds version of Atlantic City is just to me, that's like I think he had a few more pieces in the band then. And it was just like this really fun thing. and then I'll do like a little bonus cut. Uh, um, the New Orleans Jazz Festival set that he did, it was the first year, he headlined the year after Katrina when they first brought back Jazz Fest in New Orleans. And that set has like, you know, it's it's got horns and it's got some moments of like that Zydeco sound. And to me, it's just the ultimate adaptation of like what he does but then paying homage to this place and this city. And um, I've seen interviews of people talking about being there and like everyone was just like crying and emotional and it's just this really beautiful thing. And so I think, you know, more than just songs, there's been these like moments in his career that, that, that stick out to me and speak to who, and again, you know, this is me talking about a completely parasocial relationship. This is a person that I've never met. I've never had any interaction with. Of course I have like a vision of what I think it's like. And that vision has been sort of shored up by, I mean, I've literally never heard a bad story about someone meeting Bruce. Um, and you know, people say, don't meet your heroes, you know, except for me, except Bruce Springsteen, except John Stewart. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> again though, this is, that's the culture that's, you know, um, I think it has a lot to do with just where we're from. I think we grew up in it. I think it's a big part of like who we are and why we are the way we are. And um, I think there's a difference. Well, one, going back to you and millions of other people have that relationship with him. Yeah. Right. As, as fans, you know, and just the, the picture he has painted in his career of things that you and I both have experienced because we grew up in an area not far from where the songs were about early on. Right. Right. And I think there's a difference between picturing, you know, when he's referencing driving and whatever, you're like, Oh, I, we've driven on some of those roads <laughs> that the songs are about, which, but like, I think any there it's in every person scene he's describing. Yeah. You everyone know? has that highway in their town. Mm-hmm. Everyone has that, you know that main street that store that factory that person that girl you know these are all the joke is you know how every every girl is named maria or right you know (laughs) mary uh because you know these are these might not be about specific people these are archetypes these are archetypes Yeah. yeah and it's um that's one of the the things that he's absolutely the the best at man I really could just keep talking about Bruce Springsteen, but I feel like we, I feel like we got to the core now that like moving forward, whenever I reference him or things in the shop, hopefully people have a better understanding of what, what that means to me and to you. Yeah. I, I think I love that you have found an outlet for, you know, not just fandom, but uh, a thing that's meaningful in your life and clearly meaningful in so many other people's lives that when I'm standing in the shop with Camille sometimes, or when I've minded the shop earlier, the, the people come in and they just go, where's the Bruce Springsteen hat? And yeah. like, there's color. There's a color choice. Now you have color choices on yeah. the wall. We've got four colors you can choose from. Um, it's, it's certainly, it's branched out. And also if Camille looks into that camera right there, <laughs> if you want one, 
Yeah, if you want uh, we'll one a, of these we'll fine put a hats. Link in the, if you're listening, we'll put a link in the description to what we're talking about <laughs> so you can take a look at the, the hats that Camille has created. Um, and it'll probably be on our Instagram so you could take a yeah a sneak peek at it. But um, there'll be a link in the description if you're listening and if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, there'll be a link below to click if you want to buy a hat or any of the cool stuff we're wearing. Yeah, we're pretty much NB Goods out today. Yeah. Camille just did a whole drop of these. Let me see if I can get this. Yeah, we don't just make Bruce hats. We make all kinds of fun stuff. Maybe uh, maybe I'll I'll conjure up a little discount code for the for the podcast. Yeah, peeps. so if you're listening and you hear this portion, check in the description of the podcast. So if you're watching on YouTube, look below in the either in the comments or in the notes section down down under. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, there'll be a little discount code if you got this far in, in the Bruce cast today. Yeah. That's that's uh, my penance for making everyone listen to me talk about Bruce Springsteen, is that I'll give you a discount code. <laughs> well, take a look in the notes, show notes or in the YouTube notes, and you might find a little treat. So, yeah, grab, grab a United States versus Bruce Springsteen hat or all the other rad goods that Camille has in her store at NB Goods, shop NB Goods. Not all of them have as good of a story. Some of them are just for fun, but uh, yeah, I'm 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 really excited about what we've been able to do with with this piece, and you know, hopefully there's some more cool stuff on the horizon. Maybe uh, you know, maybe Bruce will be on the podcast. I mean, we can both dream about that. <laughs> I would I'd be stepping all this stuff up, all yeah. the production up for that. <laughs> but yeah, if anybody has a lead on Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> for Camille email me Evan Peary at gmail.com and we'll make uh we'll make Camille's day <laughs> gosh <laughs> this will be a I long like get weird. This is a I long get play. really weird thinking about this is like a long what that play. moment would be like this for is me. a long play from Evan Peary so let's let's uh yeah, as much as I hope I, it happens I will make sure there are cameras <laughs> there so email me um I think that's it though for this one I I, I told Camille from the start we were going to do a Bruce episode because again just to get to know us you got to know like our our historic category here of New Jersey and the shore and Bruce Springsteen and the post show. If you're, if you've made it this far and you want to check out the post show on YouTube, uh, come check out our debate on pork roll or Taylor ham. Yeah. I mean, that one could go on even longer than this. So but we're, we're going to try not to, do if you're that. not bored of us already, <laughs> when you hit, pause or this ends and just moves on to something else in your spotify feed come find us on youtube it's youtube.com slash at make your own luck pod there there'll be is. a link in the description and in the show notes or if you're watching this on youtube it'll be feeding up somewhere in your feed but come watch our debate on pork roll versus taylor ham we love a it. classic new jersey debate that's right all right well that's it that's that's our jersey boss episode all right See you next time. See you guys soon. Cool. Well, that that was me talking about Bruce Springsteen quite a bit. Um, I tried to, you know, talk about a lot of different aspects of Bruce, different reasons, you know. I know that obviously he's a musician, but um, there's a lot of other reasons why I love him, and I hope that came through. I think so. I would also say, don't forget if you're still looking to try to secure a United States versus Bruce Springsteen hat, which we touched on, that info will be in the show notes. Um, if you've made it this far, there also was a, there's a little treat uh, discount code Camille yeah. talked about. Yeah. Do you want to give it to them? Since if they made it this far, they're really listening and they're true, they're hopefully true fans so far. I think, what did you make it? Make your own luck. Yeah. So if you are on the shop NB goods site, and you put make your own luck in all one word, it'll Get give a you a little treat, discount. A little treat. Um, so yeah, thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you liked the pod, if you want to hear more, you can follow us on all of our socials at make your own luck pod. Uh, we're on Instagram. You can also put that in on YouTube and then uh, you can listen to other episodes of the podcast anywhere that you like to listen to podcasts, whether that be Spotify, uh, Apple, all the things google i think we're on yeah we're also on iheart which is cool so they have a whole podcast platform so if you the biggest thing that would help us is come and subscribe if you're in your your favorite podcast player subscribe leave us a comment 
Uh, also, if you go to our actual podcast site, which is on Spotify, but it's linked in the show description, on our socials, etc., you can come leave us a voicemail or voice message and ask us a question or feedback from this episode, why you love Bruce Springsteen, maybe. Leave us a little voicemail. Maybe it'll appear on a future episode. Yeah, we can't wait for, to hear from you. Thanks for, for tuning in. Yeah, we'll, we'll see, see you, you next time.